first year to begin, we're actually going to start looking into the book of Enoch. We've had these series where he's talking about how the book of Enoch is quoted from as scripture and the writings of Peter, the head of the apostles, right? And the writings of Jude, the Lord's brother. So, and then uh, Robert says his, his, he can do a, a series on, uh, on Enoch, and he wants to start off with Judgment Day prophecies. But he might move on to the Son of Man prophecies. And we see, in, in the Bible, we have the Son of Man prophecy in Daniel chapter 7. But then uh, Enoch has a lot of Son of Man prophecies about this cosmic, pre-existent, divine figure, right, who's going to become carnate. It's Christ. Jesus says he's the Son of Man. What does that mean? To understand what Jesus is saying, Look at the Aramaic of, of the book of Enoch, the Aramaic of uh, Daniel chapter 7. So let's have uh, have Robert come up and, and start getting into, make sure everybody has a little condensed version of the book of Enoch. Or it's actually selections, he's just focusing on a theme. So uh, for the most part, um, I was um, going to focus on the, uh, the Judgment Day sections in the book of Enoch. There are a lot of different sections in the book of Enoch and I think that probably each one needs to be looked at sort of individually and sort of in and of itself as well as you know in the context of the whole. I mean you can't separate out everything but um, I wanted to focus on the uh, the judgment day aspects of it because well that's where we're at. Yeah. Um, okay so one of the things is we've been talking about in this thing, trying to lay the groundwork for getting into Enoch, because it's, you know, you could just jump right into it, but people maybe won't understand um, the, the, the point. Um, the, the overall point is that this book is meant to be restored to us at some point in the future. What we find from the canonical book, speaking about eating what they placed before you, if our spiritual food is the scriptures, right, and we go out into Christendom, we have two really entire books dedicated to the offense, to the defense of the book of Enoch. Okay, this is what it would have been tr sort of trying to demonstrate through, you know, looking at the interrelationship between the two and, and how they sort of spill over into the book of Revelation. Uh, also looking at the time frame. Peter speaks of a day as, as a thousand years and a thousand years are as a day. The book of Revelation speaks of a thousand year period, for example, as being, you know, the, uh, the millennium, the great, you know, the, the, when we will rule as kings and priests with him on the earth. Um, and we were talking about the timeline. Remember, we talked about the seven churches, and we ended up with the church of Laodicea and the church of Philadelphia. The church of Philadelphia had a crown the same as the church of the uh, Smyrnians, right, that they had... Um, you know, to, to them, you know, if you're faithful unto death, I will give you a crown of life. So that's a promise, right? And then the Philadelphians um, have overcome, and so they have been given a crown, right? Let no man take your crown. So you're already in possession of it. So the crown is symbolic of having overcome the great age of darkness, the great age of deception. Um, but the whole idea is that the two books especially are specially made to answer certain questions. You could tell the questions by the answers. What, uh, you know, it, when they told us about the power and coming of our Lord, right? In other words, behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute yes. judgment. So apparently, what you have is you have them going out into the world proclaiming the veracity of the book of Enoch and other books. Remember, we talked about Enoch had the Son of Man sections, right? We talk about in Luke at the Transfiguration, where he's expressly named by Luke, a canonical source, right? That he is the elect one, right? Which is the same terminology as we find in Enoch. So these are symbolic things that exist within our Gospels, right? In other words, this is the food that they place before us, right? So then we can take and eat it, right? And then be given the, the ability to spiritually heal the spiritually sick among them. You know what I'm saying? We understand this in spiritual terms. So we already have the mechanism, and we already are where, where we're supposed to be on the timeline, right? We as the Church of Philadelphia, right, the book, the book speaks of this as the congregation of the righteous or the congregation of the elect, right? That's basically pointing to specifically the Church of Philadelphia, right, which is what we would be presumably 
if we were to recover this knowledge, if we were to recover this information that has been left for us but lost to us because it shines as a light, again, Amen. in a dark place, right? The dark place, of course, being this age, this age of darkness, right? The, uh, the, the time of confusion, right, which we have been in. Uh, and so I wanted to sort of build up to that place so that when we look at these judgments and prophecy of, um, of Judgment Day spoken of in the Book of Enoch, we see them in exactly the context that we're supposed to see them in. We come at these uh, already with, an, with a mind that is capable of understanding what the Book of Enoch is. I, I'm pretty satisfied that if, you, if, you're, if you're with me to the point where you understand what I'm saying right now, you can easily understand the Book of Enoch. I mean, easily understand it. Um, it. It's not difficult at all. In fact, it's like it's like you're able to open up your mind and your eyes to something that it all has been so hidden. familiar. Yeah, yeah. and that's well, that's what I. This he's been going over around this for a while. Too. It, just, it yeah, will seem familiar you, to you. Once you read it, it's just like that sounds so, really familiar. It's a lot of material. So what's hoping to do sort of unlike, because I done, I've done a lot of jumping around. You can't avoid doing jumping around because information is here, well, there, well, and everywhere. Had a good overview. But, but, but I, I, I wanted to, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you guys are with me to this point because this is sort of the payoff. Mm -hmm. Because this is, the acceptance of this book and the return of this book, it cannot be overstated how cosmic and important this is. I mean, in terms of, in terms of, where we are in time and space and, and the whole conflict between good and evil. It seems really weird and strange to be able to to be able to articulate something that is supposed to be a mystery. But it, it, again, it speaks of itself again and again and again as being understandable on that day. People will come to understand the works of this book. You know, the light shall appear to them. You'll see these things over and over and over again. But when you know what they mean and you can articulate what they mean. And you can go over the arguments that are left for us in the canonical scriptures, you know, by the prophets themselves. I mean, you can piece together the scenario of what was going on. They were out there pushing for the the the, the belief of these books, apparently. The apostles were. And when Jude went to his crowd and he said, listen, this is the teaching of the apostles, right? He was met with questions and doubts, right? Uh, so then he addresses what those questions and doubts are because he has to underscore that before he gives the quote, for example. He, he cites the name of the source, he gives it its antiquity, all that stuff we've been over a thousand times, right? But why does he do that? Because, because by saying that it's ancient, by saying that it's prophetic, by saying that it bears on his time and it bears on the time to come, he's making it so that you can understand at some point that that whole message has been lost to us, mm -hmm. hidden from us, taken from us, and our heritage has been stolen, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. And that we as Christians, it's incumbent upon us to recover that mystery and to show it to the people of the world. In fact, it very explicitly says that in the book of Enoch, if you go to where it's 104 and 105, um, it's towards the end of the book. Um, uh, I wanted to sort of just underscore that before we just jump right in. Uh, I'm going to have to kind of track along this, so I'm going to kind of read it and explain it as I go along, but this particular section is on the last page of the handout, uh, the highlighted section. Okay, now, again, for him to write something means that it's going to happen. You have to sort of take that for granted. But this is for believer and unbeliever alike. This is, this is a... This is, the, the, the proofs are irrefutable. He does say he's ancient, he does say he's a prophet, right? The idea that that book was then subsequently brought to an apostle, presumably with the question of, is this apostolic? Is this genuine apostolic teaching? And Peter very manifestly picks up this book and writes around it and writes in defense of it and augments it and, you know, adds answers to questions that uh, about its authenticity. Is it a cleverly concocted fable? Is it written by the will of man? Were the people of old time, you know, in other words, the antediluvian age, were they really inspired by the Holy Spirit? These are questions that he very literally addresses, right? Now, if that information gets lost to us, 
then it's as if it's locked up. And if it gets revealed to us, it is as if it is unloosed, right? So in other words, it fulfills the notion that Peter himself has these keys, right? So you see this stuff. It becomes, it becomes objective rather than subjective. It becomes clear rather than murky. Right? And so the idea here is to bring clarity to this book and to bring, you know, to give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Because when you get it, you got it. When you see it, you understand it. Right? So what it expressed to you that's, that's dark and murky to some people and is meant to be... Uh, uh, see, the, the, the fact is that if the, at the higher level meaning, if the heavenly meaning is embedded in, couched in, right, uh, the earthly level meaning, right, then you can fall from the heavenly meaning to the earthly level meaning while still preserving the heavenly level meaning. Because as long as you're not changing the words themselves, then your understanding of the word could change. And just like we went from dawn to dusk, remember in Thomas we talked about do not worry from dawn until dusk, right, what you will eat and what you, know, what you will wear, right? So the idea is that, that there's a loss of this mystery, right? But, you know, do not worry from dawn until dusk, nor from dusk until dawn, about what you will eat and what you will wear. So it talks about the spiritual dawn to the spiritual dusk, but then you go from the spiritual dusk, again, from the spiritual to the spiritual dawn, right? The day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts. You see how it all just goes around on itself, right? So, again, it's just, it's not yes and no, it's one giant yes. So, jumping into 104, um, round about verse 9, it says, um, be not godless in your hearts, and lie not, and alter not the words of uprightness, nor charge with lying um, the words of the Holy Great One. Okay, so one of the things that we do fundamentally, tacitly or explicitly, we accept the fact as Christians that Enoch is not inspired because we've been instructed that he's not inspired. That the book itself is of none effect because it has not been canonized, nor has it legitimately been preserved by Christendom, you know, it was made anathema and it was destroyed. So when you understand that this pertains to, to this book and of course to other books as well, but you know, um, they did charge him with lying um, because they, they countered what Jude said, they countered what Peter said. So these are these men that he spoke of, right, the, that the Lord's coming to judge, right? Uh, they're taking into account your idols, again, your man's views, the things, the works of the, hand, the hands of men, their thoughts, their minds, their ways, whatever, produce these idols. For all your lying and all your godlessness issue not in righteousness, but in great sin. And we can see the, the, the effects of that. Because having lost the mystery or whatever, then we've been strung out, um, strung along, I mean, by people who have strung us along. Um, knowingly and not knowingly, the people at the beginning had to know the mystery and consciously subvert it. That's why Peter points out to us that it would have been better for these people not to have known the way of truth than to have um, turned their backs on the sacred command that was handed down to them, right, um, by us, the apostles, right? So again, it is apostolic according to Peter and according to Jude. And so, but, but see, that this, okay, so this brings the consequence of the loss, right? But because the lower has been, the upper has been couched in the lower, and the lower is the means of conveyance, right? So that if, if you remove the spiritual and leave only the physical presence of those words, those letters, or whatever, you go from the depths to the surface level. You see what I'm saying? You go from the heavenly to the earthly understanding. Um, that leaves it open for the restoration, right? I want you to recall the words that were spoken in the past, right? So it's all about recollection. So it's lost and found, and all of those things pertain to this understanding. So this is about the restoration of the spirit and the seizing of power at the end of the age. So this is about seizing the power not only from the church, but from the world and from the whole world of unbelievers. It's, it's just that important. So then he says, and now I know this. Um, uh, now I know this mystery that sinners will alter and pervert the words of righteousness in many ways. And we've gone over some of those. And will speak wicked words, again, against his greatness, against his truth, against the prophets themselves, the way that Diotrephes, for example, prays against John or whatever, that, that's left for us to understand in retrospect so that we know that these things did happen. And lie and to practice great deceits. And I would say that uh, covering this up is a great deceit, for example. Uh, and uh, write books concerning their words. 
you know, if historians written, you know, theologians written a thing or two throughout the past, you know what I'm saying, in their own words, from their own point of view. Uh, but when they write down truthfully all of my words in their languages and do not minish aught from my words, but write them all down truthfully, again, right, all that I testified concerning them, then know another mystery, that books will be given to the righteous and the wise to become a cause of joy and uprightness and much wisdom, and to them shall the books be given, and they shall believe them and rejoice over them, and then all of the righteous who have learnt therefrom all of the paths of righteousness shall be recompensed. So this is about the recompense. This is, some of it is payback, some of it is judgment, but see, it's, it's, just, it's just two sides of the same coin. Because see, for those who, who concealed the truth, for those who murdered the prophets, for those who, who squelched the mystery, for those who destroyed the books, for those who, who got people to disbelieve the scriptures that they have in front of them, by subtly saying, you know, just because it says this doesn't yeah, mean that, that just because, you know, you read this doesn't mean that, you know, blah, 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 blah. They, they injected a venom into your belief because it only takes the, the faith of a mustard seed just to go along with what Jude says. It only takes the faith of a mustard seed to go along with Peter says that it's meant to be extraordinarily easy because if it's extraordinarily easy to understand, the mind of a child with the simplicity of righteousness, right? right? Making straight the ways of the Lord, right? Making straight his paths, right? Then when the when the sinners and the world or whatever, when they come against it, right, then it can be used against them. Why did you not, you know, do this? Why did you not do this? Why did you act this way? You know what I'm saying? So there it, it's meant to be something that it could have been seen, could have been understood, if only, right? If only what? Well, it says, um, yeah, to the um, to them shall the books be given, they shall believe in them and rejoice over them. Then shall all the righteousness who have learned therefrom all the paths of uprightness be recompensed. Right? So the idea is that it is a function of, of being upright, learning the paths of righteousness and belief. Right? And it says, in those days, the Lord bade them to summon and testify to the children of earth concerning their wisdom, right? That's at his coming with ten thousands of his saints, his holy ones, showed unto them, for you are their guides. Remember we talked about the Church of the Philadelphians, that their job was essentially to go to the, um, the Laodiceans, right? Because, again, the, the Philadelphians had an open door, right? And um, the... Um, he tells the Laodiceans, literally, behold, I have set before you an open door, right? I stand at the door and knock, right? So if you, if you open up the door, which is the scriptures, and hear my voice, which is that higher level language you hear with the spiritual ear, not just the ear of carnality, you see with the spiritual eye, not just the, the, the fleshly eye, right? So this is our job, is to go out into the world as ten thousands of his saints, right? Um, as sort of the forerunners, as sort of the vanguard, and try to, ch to show it to the people of the world. So this is like kind of a grace period, if you will, because it's judgment to the sinners and light to the righteous. The yeah. same thing that, re that frees the, the slaves and, and opens up the eyes of the blind and heals the lame and, and, and makes us whole, right, is the same thing that undercuts and destroys those who have kept us down and who have put us in the chains and the shackles and have covered up our eyes and are, have covered up our ears and have stolen it and blinded our hearts and our minds and have stolen the truth from us. Even the very words themselves they've stolen from us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it says, show it to them, for you are their guides, right? And a recompense over the whole earth. For I and my son, right? This is, this is why it's Enochian, right? Yeah. Because he's speaking of the son. And this is way before Moses. This is way before Abraham, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, you could trace back. I mean, you know, I understand this is the situation here, but it goes back further than Hebrew roots. This is further back than mm -hmm. most, most Christians are, and Jews are willing to go, mm -hmm. right? But it's, it's still a reward upon the um, righteous. It's still a reward for us at the end of time. 
to, to be taken all the way to the beginning and shown things exactly from yeah. the beginning. It says, for again, I and my son will be forever um, uh, united with them forever in the paths of uprightness in their lives, and you shall have peace. Rejoice, you children of uprightness. Amen. And again, amen means that it's truthful. So somebody's gone through there and checked for it. You know what I'm saying? Or that it's, it's a demonstration that it is true. Let it be so. Right? That's, that's their kind of their code word for this is mm -hmm. the truth. So if you go back to the beginning, to the understanding that it speaks of in chapter 1. So just go to the front of the book, right? You understand the blessing. The words of the blessing of Enoch, right? So we heard that, right? It is a, that you shall be given books, you shall be given wisdom, you shall be able to show it to the people of this world, right? Because you were a blessing upon the earth, right? So the words of the blessing of Enoch, wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous who will be living again in the day of tribulation, right? That, those are basically the Philadelphians and the, the, the converted Laodiceans, let's say, and for the whole rest of the world for that matter. Um, but most of us, there were kind of like sleeper cells. We have all of this stuff already in our hearts and our minds, and, and we're just waiting for the light to come on. And when it does, then you see it, right? So it says, it says, so the words of the blessing of the Enoch, wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous, who will be living in the day of tribulation, when the wicked and the godless are to be removed. Then he took up his parable and said, Enoch, a righteous man whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, which the angels showed me, and from them I heard everything, and from them I understood as I saw. But again, not for this generation, but for a remote one, which is for to come, which of course is the final generation, the one on day seven, which is where we're at now, and concerning the elect, right? Remember, Yeshua said that I will give you a new name, right? That is the elect. And I took up my parable concerning them. So this book is always meant for us, right? So that we can show it to the world and reveal it to them with wisdom, right? And to show them things right. So the Holy One will come forth from his dwelling. I mean, you can see this sort of in, in the, on a metaphysical level, right? Where is his dwelling? His dwelling is in the Word, right? The, the Lord himself speaks through the Scriptures, right? He dwells in each and every one of us. He dwells in all things, you know? Not in a sort of a pantheistic kind of way, but as, as, a, as a creation, it bears the stamp of its creator. Everything in creation, right, bears the stamp of the creator, this is why Paul says, you know, the, the what is uh, knowable about God is visible in his creation. And so they are without excuse, right? Um, but in other words, he's going to come out of hiding. The holiness, the, the greatness of the Holy Great One or whatever is going to become manifest, right? And the eternal God will tread upon the earth, even Mount Sinai, and appear from this camp. And again... If you can see this in the visual, you know, I don't know how this is going to look in the real world. I know that in the metaphysical, the idea is that what is earthly is, is, is set, in a sense, over against what is heavenly, although the earthly and the heavenly are both holy, because the holy, the way that Thomas puts it is that, that the heavenly, he speaks of the heavenly in terms of wealth, and he speaks of the earthly in terms of poverty, because... Um, you know, knowing it on the one level, then you have spiritual riches. And knowing it on the other level, then you have only the physical, only the flesh, and that's spiritual poverty, right? It's talking about rich towards God or poor towards God. You know, that's kind of the idea. Um, so when he says that, um, that, um, that he is astonished uh, about how this wealth has been, has been placed inside of this poverty, what he's talking about, He's astonished at the way in which the spiritual level, the spiritual meaning, has been couched in or has been placed in physical terms, right? This is because if, if, if flesh came from spirit, that is a marvel, right? So the idea is that if the spiritual has couched itself in the earthly, right, that is a marvel, right? But if the spiritual comes forth from the flesh, that is a marvel of marvels. In other words, that is the that is the return, if you will. So in other words, you know, he says, but yet I am astonished at how this wealth has come to make its home in this poverty. In other words, for all the spiritual wealth that we're talking about right here, right now, the poverty of the teaching has kept us all from seeing it for 2,000 years um, since it first dawned. So in other words, he's going to manifest himself. And again, 
and shall appear in strength, the strength of his might, from the heaven of heavens. And all shall be smitten with fear, and the watcher shall quake. Well, again, in, in, the, in the physical sense, I mean, I think it's easy to visualize this, and I'm not saying it's not going to happen Sounds in a familiar. physical kind of way. Yeah. But, but again, he does say it's a parable, so I'm just speaking to those aspects of it. There may be other aspects that I, that, you know, I don't know how this is going to manifest in the real world, but I know on the level of the Spirit, what he's saying is that he's going to go from weakness, if you will, to strength, right? The scriptures are going to go from a, a level of weakness to strength because he dwells in those things. He is in those things, and he's going to manifest himself through those things. Um, and great fear and trembling shall seize them unto the ends of the earth. Um, again, one of the one of the more interesting concepts that you see, like in um, uh, there, there are a lot of there's so many things to go into. Um, there's so many things that you kind of have to understand symbolically. Like for example, what what do we mean by north? What do we mean by south? Uh, what do we mean by east? What do we mean by West, for example, right? Um, so, essentially, you have sort of this north-south direction, right? And that has to do, remember how Satan wanted to make his throne in the sides of the north, right? right. In symbolic speech, north tends to have to have to do with things that are more towards Yeshua, oh, right. or I'm sorry, um, Yahweh. Doing that right. And then the stuff that has to do with the South, generally speaking, has to do with the devil. Right. Um, or Satan. Right? And even in our colloquial speech, we talk about that. You know, things kind of went south. You know what I'm right, saying? Right, right. Um, and then you have East, which is early in time. Right? Right? So that's earlier. So you see, like, Eastward in Eden, for example. The idea is that you're moving, you know. Um, to this this direction in time and so and if of course correspondingly um, you see the West that's later in time right? right so when you see like the four corners if you will of the earth or whatever right. that's sort of with symbolic okay so like when you see something like um, somebody's moved towards the south or somebody's moved towards the east you see a lot of this stuff in like the journeys section in Enoch and, you know, certain other places within the canonical scriptures as well. Um, Basically, they've life. fallen or they've lost their... Yeah, and so, like, yeah. when you see something, like, in the book of Enoch where it talks about he was taken to the ends of the earth and he went to the north and the west, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You understand that, that towards the end of time and towards the side of God, right? So if Enoch was taken towards the northwest, for example, you get the sense that that this is when God's reign is right at the end of time because you're right. putting two and two together, mm -hmm. right? So it's kind of right there before your face, but I mean, that's just a concept to kind of help you understand. Um, another concept, um, mountains and hills, right? Okay, there's, there's two kinds of things. There's dry land, which is like the secular, right? The notion is that it's not founded on the Word of God, that the Word of God is what makes it, if you will, wet. You know, the lack of the Word of God, if you will, is kind of like dry. So you have like the dry land and you have the sea, right? Which is, of course, like, um, I'll just say religion, because the, that sea represents the age that we're in now. So when you see things like, for example, the angel had a, you know, one foot on, you know, the sea and one foot on the dry land, right? He's talking wow. about the age, right? Cool. And he says his right hand, which again, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Wow. So your right hand is knowledge and your left hand is ignorance, right? So his right hand, you know, is lifted up into the heavens, right? You know what I'm saying? Um, and you see that kind of symbolism, right? That's what it yeah, means. Yeah. And that's why, like, for example, you know, these wicked people in the Even church. The Baphomet, as are, above, so below. Yeah, well, yeah. you see the, the people in the church are wild waves of the sea, right, right? right? The idea is that the sea represents the Christian era, if you will, and that these are high places, right, in Christendom, right? Or if you see mountains, 
right? And then you see hills, right? You see that these are like high places, right? Like these might be, you know, great kingdoms or great, you know, secular establishment world, right? Or you might see lesser establishments, you know, you might think of, you know, world governments or you might think of, you know, um, smaller regional province, you know what I'm saying, or you might think of great men, Alexander the Great, or you know what I'm saying, and you might think of lesser people, right? But the idea is that it's founded upon the dry land, or it's founded upon the water of the word, right? So the, that's another concept. The book that he has in his hand, just to fill that out, the book that he has is the little book. Right? Why is it little? Right? Because it's limited. Right? So that's why he, you, eat, you eat it, right? It's sweet as honey in your mouth because the 66 books, there's nothing wrong in any of them. They're sweet as honey in your mouth. Right? 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 But because you accept some things and not others, right? Because the, the specter of doubt about the truth of their extra canonical references that they make limits you to that box, right? and it makes your belly bitter. So the idea is that this is all kind of a picture language, right? And so this is kind of, uh, you know, kind of your hint. And that's why he says, of course, that you must prophesy again, you know, because it, it, it wasn't enough, right, before nations and peoples and tongues and kings. So again, reveal it to them with your wisdom, right? See, it all goes around on itself. So they're all related concepts that once you kind of get it, once you kind of see it, then you can't unsee it, right? And so that's sort of the nature of truth, is that, is that, is that like I said before, you get it, you got it. You know, you see it, you understand it, right? And it, it can't be hidden from you. Um, so you're gonna see a lot of symbolism in the book, and, and most of it's pretty simple to explain, just like that. And it takes that which is almost, it can't be understood, unless you see it that way. You know what I'm saying? So that's the source of confusion, is that people have been, they, they lack the knowledge, right? My people perish for lack of knowledge, right? But the, 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 what, the end, what you have at the end is all, always described as knowledge. It's, it's almost never referred to as faith. When you talk about end time stuff, it's knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. They will see, they will understand, they will know. You know what I'm saying? You see that, right? Because it's a different thing. Because one is permanent and one is impermanent, right? He talks about, and you, and you start seeing hidden things, like you see what, you know, what is from age to age and what is forever, right? What is from age to age is that which is lost and recovered, and what is forever is that which never left. So that's like the little book, right? And so you start to parse it out in terms of seeing it that way. So when you see the high mountains being shaken and the high hills made low and melting like wax before the flame, the whole earth will be rent and sunder. You see in um, Thomas, for example, you see, uh, you split apart the wood, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You lift up the stone. Okay. So, again, lifting up the stone, if you're seeing, trying to see it metaphorically, um, you're, you're, you're taking that which is stony or whatever and you're raising it up, and then at, at the point at which you take it from the lower to the higher, in other words, you're lifting it up, right? Then you can see the truth. Or you split a piece of wood, right? Because if you will, there is a heavenly and an earthly aspect to it. And of course the wood is the, um, the, the scriptures, right? If you can understand that there's an upper and a lower, right, then you split it, right? Or if you're able to lift up the stone, again, the stone that was rejected, right, becomes the cornerstone, corner stone, stone. right? Yeah. So you get, to, you get to kind of understand that they're speaking sort of symbolically. So that's why he says he's a parable, right? Because there's all kinds of parabolic language and parabolic speech, but it's the same language that unlocks the canonicals. So, in other words, you're, you're seeing the harmony here. You're seeing the relationship here, right? And so this is about this is about leveling up. This is about you know how you have the first revelation through Moses and the prophets, and you have the second revelation, which is the New Testament. And this is the third, holy, holy, and holy, right? That which is, that which was, and that which is to come. Right, I have sheep that are not of this fold, uh, you know, etc. He's speaking of a future generation. That's this generation. So it's important to see where you are in the situation here. 
Um, and it says, and the whole earth will be wholly writ and sunder, and all that is upon the earth shall perish. So all that means is that all of our earthly understanding is going to disappear, right? Those who dwell on the earth. Revelation uses speech like this, right? Those who dwell on the earth, right? There is the vine of the earth, and there is the true vine, yeah. right? You see, and that's why Thomas says, for example, that um, a great vine has been planted outside of the Father. Which one is that? That's but being unsound, it will be pulled up by its roots, right? So that's the vine of the earth, one that gets trampled. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's all the same language. They're all, talk, they're all on the same page. And that's what you come to recognize, that you come to understand, that they all use the same language. And again, so that all that is upon the earth shall perish. So, uh, you know, our canon rests upon earthly thinking, right? Oh, were they an apostle, right? Were they attested to? All of the different presumed tests that they put these things through. They're so full of holes, they're so full of inconsistencies, and they're all entirely based on consensus. And consensus, so think about that. We're people, we're, fall, we're flawed, we're fallible. How could any of our consensus be the foundation for anything? So this is throwing out their baby with the bathwater. Mm. This is destroying everything. It's pulling it up by the roots, right? Like the grapevine that was pulled up by the roots, or like John the Baptist, you know, the, the, the ax is laid at the roots of the trees. Right? Uh -huh. Trees are the teachings, right? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, right? It's using symbolic. Um, and it says, and there shall be a judgment upon all men, but with the righteous he will make peace. So that's the other side of the coin. By showing the righteous the truth, the congregation of the elect the truth, right? They come to rest. They come to peace. They finally are given the eyes to see, um, the ears to hear, and the heart to understand. The, 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 the heart of stone is taken out of them and replaced with the heart of flesh. Right, so they can understand, right? Um, and he will protect the elect. Why? Because you're, you know, you're you're in a place of basic irrefutability, right? Um, in other words, you have Jude behind you, you have Peter behind you, you have Yeshua behind you. You see what I'm saying? So you have all of these forces, these powers in your corner, right? And so he will protect them, and mercy shall be upon them, and they shall all belong to God. Right? They're not going to be Methodists, they're not going to be Muslims, they're not going to be Catholics, Pentecostals, Protestants, right. whatever. They're all going to be one body. And they shall be prospered and they shall be blessed. Again, the words of the blessing of Enoch, wherewith he blessed the elect, right? So they'll be blessed with this book, they'll be blessed with this knowledge, they'll be able to understand it, right? And he will help them all, and light shall appear unto them, and he will make peace with them, right? So now you understand the context, right? that we are going to be transformed, right? We are going to be given knowledge. We are going to be given power to overturn the earthly and the religious establishment while at the same time establishing the truth and the eternal kingdom of God. I mean, it literally is that. So when you read, Behold, he cometh with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to destroy all the ungodly and to convict all flesh of all the works of their ungodliness which they have ungodly committed, and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. It's all in that context, right? So it's important to, once you get to that point, to understand why then this particular verse is singled out. Um, because when he talks about that it's for the elect, they're going to be coming with this book. They're going to be coming with this teaching. Right? Behold, he cometh with ten thousands of his saints, right? The books of his, you know, judgment, if you will. You see what I'm yeah. saying? So that's why we're starting with judgment here, right? And then judgment, again, Peter tells us, too, that, that judgment begins at the house of the righteous, right? The house of God, right? So the idea is that the, the church is being judged, the world is being judged, everything is being judged because it's the day of judgment. You know what I'm saying? So that's kind of where we're at. So it's sort of the launching point here for all of this. Um, you know, I hope to get into go by line by line because the, the exciting part is if you do have the ears to hear, if you do have the eyes to see, uh -huh. if you are able to follow and track with this, you'll understand that it's real. And when you share it with people, you'll have an ability to answer their questions and essentially heal the sick among them. Yay. Yeah, that's good. One of the issues that people have with the book of Enoch is the idea, and this is why certain church fathers advocated against it, was you have the idea the sons of God beholding the daughters of 
and women. They were fair in taking wives among them who they should choose. And uh, how do you deal with that, right? We're going to close there pretty, pretty quick because we need to transition to worship service. So, well, you have the, you know, the way the, the clear reading of scriptures is, right? It's fallen angels, angels that sin. And, you know, if you read Jude's gospel, not just as he quote from the book of Enoch, he talks about the, the, the angels that left their first estate. And then he suggests what they do is parallel to modern sexual perversion, right? Um, so he's alluding, he seems to be alluding to the book of Enoch in this story there. But Augustine and other church fathers are like, no, this is impossible because how could a, how could a spiritual being that's not material, it's not physical, it can't right. reproduce with a human, right? So how would they explain it? Uh, well, they would say that uh, the daughters of, of men or the, you know, the, the descendants of Cain, right? Or, or just generally wicked people, right? Uh, the sons, of, well, the, no, no, no. The sons of God are uh, Seth's line, right? Or righteous people. That's the idea. Who are the sons of God? Oh, it's just people. It's just good people. It's, uh, or people who are from the lineage of Seth. The daughters of men are, are, are women who were descended from Cain. And they're, you know, they're wicked women and, and and you know the righteous line being corrupted by not that this is angelic right that's that's the explanation of Genesis chapter 6